hope you can hear me clearly. Those at the back, yeah, great. So my name is Muniba, and I'll be talking about addressing algorithmic bias uh, today. So let's start and have a look at what is bias. But before that, I would uh, like to ask, can you guys read it? Yeah, you guys can read it. And uh, if you are an English speaker, so it shouldn't be a problem that you could read it and you could understand it, despite the fact that the letters in the words are all mixed up and they are not at the, the right position. So why this happens? This happens because our brain has this ability to create the shortcuts which help us understand the things. So it makes the things easier for us to grasp. And this ability of brain to make things simplified for us is called, um, this functionality is called heuristics. So heuristics are basically shortcuts of the brain that help us understand uh, the things easily in different situations. And uh, besides that, it also makes things easier for us. And uh, uh, these shortcuts um, make help, help us make sense of the things. So uh, these heuristics normally are very helpful to us because they are making the task easy. But in doing so, sometimes they create the biases. In What are biases? Biases is basically our inclination, our favoritism, our uh, disc the, the discrimination towards one thing and giving favoritism to one group of people, objects, etc., and um, having bias towards others. So uh, f there are different kind of heuristics, familiarity heuristic, a representative uh, heuristic. Familiarity heuristic is basically the pattern of favoring what is similar or what is familiar to us. This can lead to a status quo bias, a preference for the current state, the not willing to come out of the comfort zone. So this status quo, based, of the, uh, based on this status quo, 86% of CEOs in 500 Fortune companies are male white. And since this themselves are white males, so they prefer hiring the wild male because they are familiar to them. They are familiar working with them. They are familiar in recognizing or relating to them. Then similarly, if the, we are talking about representative uh, heuristics, so it can lead to the stereotyping. The unconscious attribution of particular qualities, a member of a certain social group, example, imagine nurse. So what comes in your mind? Is it a woman? Why? Because this, this is stereotype. And it has been produced because of these heuristics, the ability of our brain to simplify the things. This is a, the cognitive bias cortex, which has been developed uh, by John Mungian III and Buster Benson. This gets updated on a daily basis, and to this date, there are 150 plus biases registered in this cortex. All of these biases exist because of the cognitive limitation that our brain has. So these cognitive limitations create these biases in us. So all of you sitting here, you can't deny that we are biased. So unfortunately, because of these cognitive limitations, we are bound to be biased. What we can do is we can just overcome these biases by understanding these biases. So this was the human side of the story, that's how we are biased. So let's look into what is an algorithmic bias then, and how this bias basically transferred from humans to machines. So algorithmic bias is basically defined as the uh, it, it, when the outcome of the machine, basically, it is more inclined towards one group, when it is basically um, discriminatory. 
So the algorithms are then called the bias algorithms because their outcomes are not equal for all groups that are involved. It means that might, one might, group might be getting favored over the other, and it could be any proxy due to which this bias could occur. So algorithmic bias, machines originally, or these algorithms, they were designed to address the bias that was in us humans. So algorithms were designed so that we could make the decision uh, making unbiased, we could make it more rational, we could make it maybe um, uh, less discriminatory. But what happened that now in media, we hear a lot about the discrimination from the machines. So these are some of the examples of the bias that um, uh, that started originating as the machine or um, machine learning algorithms or AI algorithms, they came, uh, they, they started getting popularity or they started getting implemented machine. Very first one that in 2015, Google's image recognition system labeled African Americans as gorillas. Three years later, in 2018, Amazon's recognition system drew criticism for matching 28 members of Congress to criminal uh, mugshots, just based on their color. This one, a very famous, maybe some of you have heard about it. A recent study found that three facial recognitions from the top uh, companies, IBM, Microsoft, and the Chinese, uh, image recognition system, all were unable to identify a black woman. Why this happened? This happened because the data that had been fed to these systems that was inadequate. There was not enough data related to black women or black people on which our algorithms got trained so therefore, when in real life, when in deployment phase, these uh, systems encountered someone black, so they couldn't recognize them because it was new for them. It was some, uh, something new that they were not trained for. So it was basically limitation of humans that came into play when the machine started uh, uh, working or they got deployed. Similarly, if you are a person with a dark skin, you may, uh, you are, you have more chances to get an accident or get hit by self-driving cars. Again, the same reason, because the data set that has been used to train uh, self-driving cars, it did not have sufficient uh, examples of black people. So it is more um, prone or uh, it is can identify the white people and can stop. But if there is a pedestrian is a black person, so there is a chances that the car will unable to identify it and in return hit it. The authors of the self-driving car study note that a couple of factors are likely fueling the disparity in this case. The first, as I mentioned, the, is the case of insufficient data. The second is that the, the data even that was available, the machine learning algorithms did not train themselves from, from that data. Why? Because they didn't give the more weightage to those examples. So we can address these kind of issues either by providing the right data, a right amount of data, or we can address the issue by um, putting the more weightage to the less amount of data that we have. So in this way, we can protect the minorities or the smaller groups um, in the data set. Now the second example, or another example, 
which is from Amazon. Amazon, when in 2014, launched its uh, AI-based recruiting system, so it got lots of hype. But in 2015, Amazon discovered that their recruiting system was not gender neutral. So it means that the algorithm was giving more preference and actually um, putting uh, the CVs or resumes from the women aside. So this was a big shock definitely um, to all who were looking forward towards AI-based recruiting systems and all um, and Amazon as well. So what was the reason of this? The reason was that there was a human bias that got sweeped into the algorithms. Now you must be wondering how it was a human bias when it was an AI-based recruiting system. It was because the data that had been provided to the AI algorithm, again, was the data that Amazon had captured or stored in its databases or from the past 10 years. And since American tech industry is highly um, dominated by male, especially in tech and IT, so therefore the software developers in Amazon that were um, hired, you can see like from the graphs, not just um, Amazon, uh, but also other uh, companies, um, tech companies as well, they are all male-dominated. So when this data got fed to the algorithm, so algorithm assumed that male are more preferable group for recruitment. So any resume that would contain the word woman, for example, woman chess club player, woman college, woman would be discarded by the, or will be less preferable by the, uh, for, uh, for the AI or algorithms and hence discarded. Later on, Amazon addressed that issue and removed these preferences or these proxies from their system. But still, we cannot make sure that now the system will not learn new words based on which they will create discrimination. There are lots and lots of examples and from in all fields of life, whether it be a healthcare system or a criminal justice system. We have hundreds of examples uh, which, where basically AI is being biased. And it is not just discrimination. Discrimination, uh, discrimination isn't the only potential problem with the uh, these algorithms. In one of the earliest examples of problematic AI, Microsoft released a Twitter chatbot called Tay. And the idea was that the chatbot will learn from the conversations with the real human beings. And within 24 hours, the chatbot started sending racist and biased tweets. So the heart of the problem actually is not with the AI technology or the algorithms itself per se, but with how the AI power systems are trained. For these systems to perform as desired and outcomes to become increasingly accurate, training data must be diverse and it should offer the breadth of coverage. Since algorithmic systems learn from the examples they are fed. So we should feed the appropriate data and very diverse data. So it covers all um, kind of examples. So when they, we are deployed in the real life situation, so we should not see any examples like this we have seen. So how and uh, when does the bias enters the these systems. 
So it is basically, there is no one step that is where the bias enters the system. It's actually throughout the project life cycle. There, there could be many occasions where the bias can enter the system, AI system. But there are three main data entry points where the bias enters the system. The one is through the data. The other one is through the people or developers or the people who are working on these algorithms. And the third is like when the outcomes, um, um, the desired outcomes, um, such as recommendation content and search populations. Um, so through those outcomes, the uh, bias can sweep into the systems. So people write the algorithms, people choose the data they use to feed those algorithms. So therefore, it's the people's responsibility or the developer's responsibility that while choosing the data, they make sure that the first thing is that they put the right weightage to the data. They include all the ethnic groups, all the races. They should protect the data. They should get, give the clean data. And if there is some certain sensitive information, so that should be hidden from the uh, algorithms. So uh, historical human biases are shaped by pervasive and often deeply embedded prejudice against certain groups, which can lead to their reproduction and amplification in computer models. Human biases can be reinforced and perpetuated without the user's knowledge. So if the data used to train the algorithm are more representative of some groups of people than others, the predictions from the model may also be systematically worse for unrepresented or underrepresentative groups. So what are the FAIR algorithms? So now we have seen the examples of the bias algorithms, or we saw the example, the what are bias algorithms. So therefore, we have to work towards the FAIR algorithms. So FAIR algorithms are the algorithms which are not discriminatory towards one group of people or the other. So how we can make our algorithms uh, fair? So when we create the models, so they are mostly the predictive models which have to answer the questions regarding, okay, if I go to apply the loan, will I be getting the loan? Is it the right person? candidate to give the loan? Is it the right candidate to give the job? Is it the right ca candidate to be enrolled in the college? So there are four kind of uh, outcomes. Yeah, as you can see here in the diagram, it could be the, there are um, po uh, true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative. So false negative and false positive are actually the errors that are made by the algorithm or the model. So if these errors or these algorithm, these errors are distributed equally among all the groups that go through these algorithms, then we can say that our algorithm is a fair algorithm. What does it mean? It means that if there are two group of people, group A and group B, group A have five members and group B also has five members. And the error in both the groups is that just one person who was the right candidate who would have returned the loan after the period um, has been denied for the loan. So it means that is an error, that is a mis mistake because our prediction algorithm was unable to predict it accurately. So he denied the right candidate. So if among both the groups, we, our algorithm make one error, so then it means that it is a error rate parity because it has made the equal error for both the groups. Similarly, we took the group of five people yeah, group A was also five people and group B was also five people. It means that to start with, we started with um, statistical parity. 
we gave the equal amount of data and the error that got distributed uh, on the, those groups, that was also equal. So these are the two ways we can make our algorithms accurate or uh, are uh, not accurate, sorry, our algorithms more fair because there is a difference between um, accuracy and fairness and this we will be discussing. So what th this is the example here. You want to go for skiing, yeah? And there are there is this famous resort which is selling only, which has only 100 tickets to sell. So what happens there, what, what is the scenario? Now we want to choose, we are the, using this algorithm or model that which group or uh, who should be basically getting the tickets for this resort. This is quite famous resort and as you can see, there are 700 skiers and uh, almost 300 um, snowboarders who are interested to get the tickets for this resort while there are only 100. And the, the, the algorithm should be able to generate the profit while distributing these tickets. The scenario says that we have 40 um, skiers and uh, 20, I guess, uh, yeah, 20 uh, snowboarders that are more privileged and that can afford the things better when they will be give, given. So it means they will be more pro profitable for the system. So what happens that now our system has to actually choose that which one are the right candidates, keeping again in the mind that we have to generate the profits as well. So the system divides the ticket equally. So the 50 people from the skiers group and 50 people from the snowboarders will get the tickets. We are talking about statistical parity. We are satisfied. We say that, okay, our algorithm is fair because it has distributed the tickets fairly. Let's look a little bit deeply into it. Now, because this scenario should generate the profit, so when the tickets got distributed, so 40 people among the skiers got selected and 10 people um, that, that were privileged and 10 people that were underprivileged, uh, which, were less spend, which were going to spend less, got chosen. Similarly, from the other group, there were 20 snowboarders um, that, that were chosen, that were privileged, and uh, the rest were not chosen. So if we see that out of the 700 skiers who sent applications, so 40, that is like 100% from the privileged group that got chosen. So it means that the, the, the algorithm, which was seemingly fair, because there was a, static, a statistical parity on the input and there was an equal distribution of the outcomes or the tickets was not even very uh, fair when we zoomed it in. Why? Because there was only 1.5 percent, that is 10 percent, 10 tickets that were sold to less privileged group, which were going to spend less. So when, while making the algorithms, there is a trade-off. There is a trade-off between choosing the groups that we can save from the bias or the individuals. Normally, we have to compromise uh, on the individual preferences because there are, could be many factors that are not un under the control of the algorithm and then we, the group comes uh, before then, um, then the individuals. So in a way, we can say that achieving 100% fairness is kind of impossible, but we still strive. And we strive by doing two things. The one example that I have given of the equal distribution, and the other one is like, if there are some merits that are involved, then we can make sure that the error that 
is received or the error parity it sh should also be achievable or should also be targeted then comes the accuracy so what is the accuracy now we are talking about that there are errors we admit that our uh, models are not 100 percent accurate because there are some errors in our models so what do we do in traditional systems when we only use to target about uh, that uh, there should be minimum error and uh, uh, the systems should make the accurate decision so then we can only target accuracy and we can try to minimize the error rate as we would like but now we there is a fairness so when fairness comes in the formula so we sometimes have to make compromise over accuracy what is does it mean that we uh, try to minimize the error rate as long as parity is obtained so the main focus is that we have to make our algorithms accurate but keeping the parity in mind because now we want to go away from biased algorithms and move more close towards the fair um, achieving fair algorithms so in doing so if there is a some trade-off so we don't mind that so let's say again the example continues so if we had to choose only accuracy so we were okay that if there were five snowboarders and one um, skier that could get the loan yeah because we were achieving a certain percentage of accuracy and our error threshold was somewhere along the line where it says e but when we when fairness came into play so now we could see that this algorithm is not gain, giving the fair answer because one group has been chosen there are six members of one group that has been chosen or five and the there are only one mem member of the skiers so to make this algorithm we will move our threshold error threshold a little bit on the left hand side and now there we can see that we, this will include three more skiers in the uh, outcome which means that we have compromised over accuracy in order to achieve fairness so the point here is that our goal needs to be managing the balance of accuracy and fairness while acknowledging that our models are going to be imperfect at the end there is no one magical model that's going to be able to sufficiently protect every single person that comes into it but we can mo make more fair models by introducing the concept of parity so how we can combat the bias then making new algorithms fair is one technique but what about the existing uh, algorithms how to combat the bias in those algorithms so there are various things that we can do first of all we can make the inventory of the algorithms that we are using in our organization it's uh, it might sound uh, simple but there could be hundreds of algorithms that we are using without knowing that we are using those algorithms in our organization so making an active directory or inventory of the algorithms so that we could assess th those algorithms uh, once we have those that inventory then we have to screen those algorithms that means there there should be a team dedicated to make sure that there are uh, the algorithms that we are current that are currently in use they are unbiased because this example that i had given for the image recognition system uh, many companies had been using uh, it without any problem until uh, one graduate from uh, MIT when she used that image recognition system in her project and she was amazed to see that the image recognition system was unable to even identify her and she needed to literally wear the white mask 
in order to be able to identifiable by the image recognition system. So there might be hundreds of systems that are around us that we are using on a daily basis without knowing that there is a bias in these systems. So screening is the next step to making the uh, to mitigating or to um, getting rid of uh, bias from algorithms. The third is refraining bias algorithms like retraining biased algorithms, like if there are some existing algorithm, we can fix them, like Amazon's exam example, that Amazon, it removed the words like woman, and it basically retrained uh, their uh, algorithm, so it could become more fair. So this is one technique, we can fix the existing algorithms after screening and identifying the bias in them. And making the policies, making the uh, cult company culture, uh, in such a way that we encourage um, uh, the error identifying techniques, we test our algorithm for bias, and then we prevent that uh, bias uh, sweeping in to our algorithms. With this, we will look into a little bit into what, what is the screening process and how we can screen our existing algorithms. So there are a couple of steps that are involved. The first is like identifying how to recognize the fairness issues and deploy solutions in real world. The second is appraise a predictive model for fairness issue and discover auditing model attributes. So in whole of this screening process, what is it that we can control? Actually, there are very few things that we can control. Why? Because these algorithms or these models, they are quite complex. And we really don't know how they are training themselves. There are many proxies that are involved. There are many factors that are involved. There are many uh, 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 real-time situations that they are analyzing. So there are many things that are out of our control. But what we can control is like input and output because input is what we are feeding them, and output what we can evaluate. So if we change input, so here the concept of control uh, variable that comes into play, that we choose one variable at a time, and we feed our algorithm one variable at a, one, uh, one variable at a time, and keep the rest of the uh, factors constant, and observe that what are the, uh, how our output is changing. And then this is how we identify the attributes that create the auditing data. So what will be the example? So we are actually left with a blind model because we don't know what's happening in the model. Um, one does not, uh, one that does not explicitly know the race, for example, in case of Amazon. Uh, so the resume is that Amazon was providing, it didn't have the gender information. Similarly, in the criminal justice system, when um, in America's criminal justice system, we saw that people were, uh, people with the black origin, or uh, they were getting uh, more sentences than the, the one with the white. And when there was a score, to identify that who will commit the uh, offense in the future. So black uh, prisoners were getting higher risk as compared to their white um, uh, fellows. So, but, in, but that was pr being proven wrong. So despite the fact that there was no information about the race or the gender in both these cases, that the, uh, the algorithms were creating bias themselves. And why was it? Because there were many other factors that they could associate to. For example, in case of the Amazon, there was no gender information, but there was information like, there were the words like woman, women's, woman league, et cetera, which was based on which the algorithm was being biased towards the woman. In case of the prison uh, example, there was no information about the race because there were 135 questions um, or the, that questionnaire 
based on which the score was being calculated. So there was no question about that. What is your race? What is the ethnic group you come from? But there were the the questions about like which locality do you live in, which postcode do you live in, etc. Based on that, the AI could relate that this is the um, maybe male uh, the the Af uh, American African um, dominated area, or this is a ghetto, or it could be anything based on which it was creating the biased uh, scores. So here, uh, this model um, is blind, but we are, what we are doing is like we are controlling the inputs and we are evaluating the outputs. So it is like if we give the resume to uh, during the alg algorithm auditing phase. So first of all, we will be using this um, algorithm, which will basically analyze all the text uh, within these resumes and then it will create maybe bag of words or certain um, um, uh, attributes out of by analyzing the data that we provide and then based on that data what we will do is like we will choose one parameter one input variable at a time and then we will under the control condition see how does it affects the output Based on that, we can create the report, um, the audit report, which tells us that, okay, um, this variable is acting, and then we can scale them, like, okay, uh, the first one, maybe the gender, it is having the adverse effect, uh, the woman, it is having uh, less, little less effect than that, so we can scale the outcomes in a Priorical, um, periodical order or the chronological order and then we can create the uh, report based on which we can address the issues of the bias in the algorithm. So this is this technique is basically algorithmic uh, auditing technique. So when we are um, auditing the algorithm, so there should be the four uh, rules that we should take care of. The first is that change one input, keep others the constant, as talked about. Score a weight of input attributes and output. Uh, we have to give the weightage to our input um, so that we could know that which one, which input is creating a drastic effect. The third is like assemble a picture of the models through blind spots and then present audit report and begin investigating into um, biased data or fairness metrics. So create this matrix out of um, uh, this analysis or uh, audits and based on that take the measures for the future. It is, it sounds very easy but it is pretty challenging when we talk about implementing it. Why is it? Because there is no one definition of uh, AI bias. There could be a various definitions of bias uh, in various organizations, in various, various setups, various situations. There, are, there is no uh, standard or accepted uh, definition of systematic unfair. What does systematically unfair means? There are also few standards or metrics to measure the fairness, leaving each company to reach its own definition of bias and how to measure that bias and how to take the uh, actions against it. Um, so another issue is that the AI models likely use both new data and historical data. So while you can uh, control the historical data maybe, but you cannot control the new data because that's, it's being generated and it um, the, tells about the current situation. Um, so the constantly evolving uh, world will produce the different data uh, which will be used. So there are so many factors actually that are unknown and there are very few um, uh, standards that exist due to making or counter count, uh, countering or mitigating the uh, AI bias is very challenging. But despite that fact, fortunately, we have certain uh, steps that we can take to make sure that we are mitigating the algorithmic bias. So the first one is, like 
identifying your unique vulnerabilities. As I said, that depending on the organization that you are working with and depending on um, the situation or circumstances, there could be a different vulnerabilities. For example, banks, retailers, and utilities, they all face different kinds of risk from potential AI bias. So you have to, what you have to do is determine your own um, vulnerabilities, the unique vulnerabilities or the challenges that you are facing in your company. And then you have to target that and calculate the result in terms of uh, financial, operational, and rep reputational risks that are associated with that bias uh, in your company. And then prioritize the focus where you should set the, the focus accordingly. The second is you have to control your data. Again, data is the key. Data is basically a main source of the bias. So therefore, uh, your traditional controls may not, might not be enough. So you need to devise the new ways of controlling your uh, data. And you have to scrutinize your data before feeding it to algorithm. And you have to make sure that your data is um, diverse, um, it uh, is weighted correctly, et cetera, before feeding it to al uh, AI algorithm. And then comes the govern, like govern AI at AI speed. What does it mean? It means increasingly AI is always on and may use data from across the organization. So your governance should keep up with it. It should be continuous and enterprise-wide. The governance should include easily understandable frameworks and toolkits as well as common definitions and controls so that both AI specialists and business users can keep up with it. Then there should be diversity. Diversity doesn't mean that there should be a gender base or race or ethnicity based diversity, but there should be diversity uh, from the business point of view as well. There shouldn't be just developers, but also like business leaders, um, your stakeholders, your lawyers, um, regulatory people, all of this should sit together to um, uh, talk about these algorithms, to, uh, to talk about the strategies, um, to mitigate these uh, biases, so that you think from different angles and take every angle into account before deploying these algorithms. Last but not, not the least, validate independently and continuously. It means that there should be an additional layer of security because here we are talking about the new and much dangerous tools than before because now we are talking about the real life um, situations like a person getting hit by a car, uh, autonomous car, uh, etc. So therefore we should validate the algorithm before sending them out. So with this, I will say thank you so much.